All right. Well, we are continuing in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, if you, or you have your Bibles and you'd like to follow along, we're in chapter 13. We're going to end chapter 13 today. And uh, in chapter 13, uh, Jesus tells several stories or parables about the kingdom of heaven. And this is not the only chapter he does so. He does so throughout several uh, chapters at this point. Because in the middle of, God, of Matthew's Gospel, the way he arranges things, he puts these parables right in the center, which are an indication to us that for Matthew, these are the things of primary importance, this understanding of this coming kingdom of heaven. And we've mentioned over the last couple of weeks that these parables about the kingdom of heaven are really parables about the church. They're parables about the coming age where this, this community of faith, which is centered around Jesus, is going to be established. A small group is going to be establishing it, and it will grow quickly. That was the parable of the mustard seed last week. It grows quickly. And it, and it begins to, to become pervasive through every element of, of society. And it will go on to eventually envelop and, and, and in some way influence the entire world. Even places today where Jesus is denied as Messiah, uh, like, for example, within Islam, Christ is very, uh, he's mentioned, even though they don't have an understanding, a biblical understanding of Christ, you know, he, he has an influence in all these things. Now, it's not saying that it's, that it's a biblical understanding, but it's just that his presence is everywhere in our world today, even in places that we don't even recognize it. And the other kind of thing that we see about this church, the, this community of faith that Jesus is talking about, is that despite human sin, which is prevalent, the church survives. And the church is constantly going through these times of, of reevaluating itself, reforming itself, Usually when we think of the Reformation, we think about the big Reformation where Martin Luther and uh, John Calvin and people like that were kind of in the center of it in the 15 and 1600s. But the truth is the church has been go goes through and has been going through and continues to go through continual times of reexamination and small reforms, sometimes big reforms, sometimes small reforms, to constantly bring itself back into the biblical expectation because it's our human nature to take things off track because we, we tend to be selfish, and through money, sex, and power, we'll take anything off track, but it takes the reform movements to bring it back on track. And in addition, we've pointed out that over the last couple of weeks, the parables of Jesus are generally, generally broken up into four types. Parables of judgment, parables of kingdom growth, parables of kingdom pervasiveness or presence, and the parables of secret treasure. And today, as we go through the parables of the kingdom, we're going to be looking at uh, a couple that are parables of secret treasure, and then a parable of judgment, and then another one about treasure. So let's get started, and let's look at the, the scripture we're going to be uh, going through today. It's in Matthew chapter 13, starting at verse 44, and Jesus says this, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went out and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away, sold everything, and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on shore, and they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets and threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous, and throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. When Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. So this ends this first big section in the Gospel of Matthew where he talks about the kingdom of heaven. It's not the last time that we see parables about the kingdom of heaven, but this is the first big section in chapter 13. And so let's begin by looking at the first two parables. He said this, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy he went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had, and he bought it. 
One of the things that takes place in my country, and I, and I don't know if it takes place in others, but we have this thing called garage sales. And are you familiar with what a garage sale is? Garage sales when you collect all your junk, your stuff that you don't want, and you try and sell it to other people. And, and you basically set up, the, in the U.S., they'll, get, they'll find all their stuff, and they'll put it, they'll sit in their driveway and sell their stuff. And usually it's for like, you know, 25 cents or, you know, it's pretty low price, but it's just really a way to get the house cleaned out. And some people love garage sales. It's like a, a hobby of theirs. They'll go from place to place on the weekends and just look for the, the hidden treasures. It's like hunting for them. You know, they, they want to find that, that hidden treasure. Personally, I cannot stand garage sales because I feel like I have enough of my own junk. I don't really want to buy someone else's junk. But, you know, different people, different things, uh, you know, make them happy, I guess. Well, I read a, f- a story a few, just a, a few days ago about a man who was uh, going to these garage sales and looking through what was there, and a bull caught his eye. There was just a bull out there. And, in fact, it looks very much like a bull that I have right here. And, and, and this is a picture of the actual bull. So you see, it's, it's very similar. I don't know why you're laughing. And he bought this bull for $35, which is a lot for a garage sale. Usually garage sale, things are around a dollar or so at the most. And then he bought it and he had it appraised. And, and when he had it appraised, it was found out that this bull was from the Ming Dynasty and it is worth $500,000. He bought it for $35. So I want to offer to you <laughs> this fine-looking bull that even you can authenticate it because it says in English, made in China. <laughs> so starting bid, I say $200,000 is, is, is pretty reasonable. So let me know if you want this. And there's a... There's a uh, a sentence at the end of the article, which I found kind of funny, it said, the lucky antique hunter asked to remain anonymous, and the unfortunate former owner of the bull has not been identified. So the guy who bought it doesn't want the dude to know, you know, that, that he has this. He's, he found this treasure, and then he's kind of hiding it away. And when Jesus tells us these parables of the kingdom, he compares it with a treasure that is so valuable that the person who finds it is joyfully willing to sell everything they have and buy it. I better put this down before I throw it across the room. So It's still available, though. <laughs> but this person finds it, and they joyfully sell everything they have in order to buy that treasure because they recognize the value of the treasure. And, and you compare that to one of the, the famous you know, conversations that Jesus has with a man in the Bible, and, and we read it in the in the uh, New Testament reading, you compare that attitude of joyfully willing to give up everything you have in order to buy the treasure that you recognize as valuable to this person who's known kind of within Christendom as the rich young ruler. Because his story is told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you get different elements of his, what he is. He's rich in one, he's young, and he's a ruler in the other. And so he's the rich young ruler. And it says this, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. So in that, Jesus is giving a little hint as to who he is. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Now notice that Jesus doesn't come to this guy with with a New Testament sense of salvation. He doesn't say, you know, trust in my sacrifice upon the cross because that hasn't happened yet. So he answers this guy from an Old Testament perspective. Keep the commandments, essentially. And then the, te- the, the man says, Teacher, uh, all these I've kept since I was a boy. And there's not a sense of arrogance in there. In fact, this is what I, I like about Mark. He has this one sentence in there that none of the other Gospels have. It says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. So what's the difference between this man 
and the people in the parables. Well, this man who is talking to Jesus cannot bring himself to believe that the treasure of following Christ is greater than all the wealth that he has. He just can't bring his mind around it. Whereas the people in the parables, when they find the treasure, they recognize its value immediately, and they sell everything they have in order to attain that treasure. And the parable, this story that Jesus has uh, with the rich young man, and the parables is not about running out and selling all your things. That's not the point of it. The point of the parable is do you recognize the hidden treasures that are available in this life? Do you recognize the hidden treasures that are available to you right now? And if you're a believer or a non-believer, there are many treasures in Christ that I think many of us walk right by without recognizing it. One of the things that Jesus does in his parables is he often uses very common events in order to uncover an extraordinarily deep teaching. And there's a reason for that. Because... It's within the common that we very often will find the profound if we take the time to look, if we take the time to live an examined life, if we take enough time to lift our heads up and look at the world around us, we'll find within the common extraordinary things if we allow the Holy Spirit to draw us into those places. Jesus' parables were always very common things. Every story that I've told you about my life you know, throughout the years of being a pastor here, none of them are extraordinary it's not about seeing aliens or doing weird stuff like that. It's just about having a boss that I had a hard time with or having you know, a situation that was, you know, it was common, but within that common there was a profound. And you're the same. You have treasures in your life of experience. But I find that most people don't really examine their life. They don't really look at what is there in order to come to realize how much God has really been working in their life. And so, And we'll talk about that more a little bit later. But I like this addition that Jesus looked at this young man and loved him because I think Mark puts it in there because he doesn't want us to think that this is an arrogant young man or an arrogant ruler. He really is coming with, with it seems to be, true desire to know more deeply what it means to follow God and have eternal life. And so Jesus appreciates who this guy is. But this man is a man who's torn between the riches that he understands, like his money and his wealth, things that he can get a grasp on. He can understand the power of this, these, this riches, these riches. But he can't understand the power of the spiritual riches that Jesus are talking, is talking about. And so the, he makes a choice between what he understands and what he can't understand. He makes a choice between what he can put his hands on and what is going to be a step of faith to sell everything he has and give it and follow Christ? And he can't make that step. He just, he just can't bring himself to do it. He can't bring himself to go from what he understands to what he doesn't understand by faith. And so he walks away. And now this guy didn't have the story that Jesus was crucified and rose again on the third day. Maybe if this was the resurrected Christ talking to him and he said, and look at my hands and look at my side, maybe this guy would have had a different response because we have the benefit of hindsight. We have the benefit. You know, at, at, at this point, Jesus to this guy is just another rabbi who's saying, sell everything you have and follow me. This is either a deeply sincere guy that you would want to sell everything and follow or this is a con man that is out to take everything you have and you know, buy himself a yacht because God told him he needed it which happens a lot today. And so this young man is in a place of struggle and he walks away. And the disciples, Jesus says, you know, that it's very hard for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of heaven and his disciples are amazed. And, when I, uh, and I think the amazement isn't so much in like a positive amazement. It's like a, oh my goodness. If this, if this guy who is blessed by God with wealth can't enter into the kingdom of heaven, who can? And, and Jesus says to him, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God for anyone it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And then this says the disciples even more amazed. And again, I don't necessarily think this is a positive amazement. I think it's like a, oh, a fearful amazement because then they say to each other, then who can be saved? Who can be saved if this is the case? And the paraphrased answer to this question is the one who recognizes the value of the treasure and is willing to live according to the value of the treasure, is going to be saved. So what do we learn from these parables? 
Well, one of the things we learn is that the, the response to the treasure is a joyful response. I think joy is sometimes something the church has kind of squeezed out of people, especially when the church became very rigid and you followed these rules and you followed these rituals. People became so scared about making sure they followed the rituals and followed the rules that they lost the joy of their faith. And I think this, this happened for many, you know, hundreds of years. It became more and more less about joy and more and more about power, control, and following rules. But the response that Jesus has in this parable that these people have is joy. They couldn't, they couldn't contain themselves. And as a response, they went out and they gave up everything to follow this thing, to, to embrace the value of this treasure because the joy of the treasure that was secret and hidden is far greater than the joy that they had in anything that was earthly. You know, there's a story, it's a very well-known story about a professor who is teaching courses in the book of Psalms, the book of Romans, the book of Hebrews, the book of Galatians. And in spite of that, he was very unhappy with his life. And he'd later say that all the time that he devoted to fasting, the long hours of prayer, the pilgrimages he would go on, the confessions that he went on, he went to Rome and he walked up the steps of the basilica on his knees, you know, leaving a bloody trail behind because he wanted to, to find himself in a place of pure devotion to God, but he actually found himself in pure despair. And he wrote, I lost touch with Christ the Savior and Comforter and made him the jailer and hangman of my poor soul. He had lost the joy. Actually, he had never really found it. He had tried to find it within the rules. He had become a monk and all these places, and he still hadn't found it. And then in the course of his studies, he realized and understood that the Jesus being taught to him by his church was not the Jesus of the Scriptures. And he began to teach things that salvation, redemption, and justification are all gifts of God's grace, and they're attainable only through faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And when this realization came to him, he could not contain his joy. He could not contain the relief he felt as that burden of, of keeping rules and following rituals was lifted off of his shoulders. And he began to tell everyone around him what he had rediscovered in the Bible that had been there, but had been lost for well over a thousand years up to this point within the church. It's, it's a very strange thing that you could lose a teaching for that long, but there's still teachings that are lost uh, that are misteachings that have been taught for 2,000 years now by some churches, but the Bible will directly contradict it. But he began to write about his discovery, and he began to write about the false teachings he'd received too, and he lost his job. His freedom was uh, in jeopardy. He was brought before emperors in order to, an emperor, in order to defend himself. He found himself launched into this long journey of worldly loss, loss of reputation. But the spiritual gain that he found changed the world because he was by no means perfect. He had a big problem with anti-Semitism, and we can't ignore that. He was a man of his times. He was not perfect, but he was used to bring about changes which has shaped the church for centuries, and that's, of course, Martin Luther. This is his story. So how do you view your faith? Do you view your faith with joy? Or do you see the treasure of salvation, the treasure of following Christ, kind of as a weary obligation? I think sometimes it's fair to say that some of us at times have found it to be a weary obligation because, unfortunately, as human beings, we tend to try and build upon what God has given us and we end up diminishing it. You know, we try and add things to it. Well, let's add this ritual to enhance it. Let's add this idea to enhance it. And we end up diminishing it. We end up always just sucking away the joy instead of just allowing it to be. And it's been my observation that sometimes people who grew up with the faith, they have a harder time really maintaining the joy because it's always been there. It's not like they discovered it, something in the field that they weren't expecting. It's always been there. And so it's a bit harder, I think, sometimes for people who grow up with faith to really see its, its treasure because it's always been there. It's as familiar as a ceramic bowl that's been sitting on the shelf for years, handed down from generation to generation, and the value of the treasure is lost until one day it gets sold at a garage sale and some guy picks it up and discovers with joy the immense value of the treasure. And in contrast, those that have had the treasure withheld, sometimes because it's been illegal in their country to proclaim the treasure, 
sometimes because their family is against the treasure. When they discover the treasure, they oftentimes do receive it with joy. And they kind of look around at the rest who have who've, who've taken this thing for granted and wonder why we're acting like eating off plates of gold is just commonplace. It's like, how can, you, how can you have this treasure and not just be ecstatic about it all the time? And I find when I run into people like that, it's a challenge for me. Because I find myself more often in the place of taking it for granted after 30 years of being a believer. But I can tell you, I long for those days sometimes. And every once in a while, you know, I'll get back to that mountain top where I find that treasure of joy in following Christ. And then Jesus tells another parable. He tells another parable of judgment. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because this is almost exactly the same message, same teaching as in the wheat and the weeds where they grow up together and then they're separated out. He says, Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down to the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up from the, sh from the shore. They sat down and collected the good fish in baskets and threw the bat away. And then this next part is almost exactly word for word how he ends the, the parable of the wheat and the weeds. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous. And they'll throw them into a fiery furnace where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Like I said, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because this is almost the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And if you want to kind of get into what that meant, uh, there's, listen to the sermon from two weeks ago. And it's pretty much the same thing, just replace wheat and weeds with the fish. There's a few differences, but not enough that we're going to get into. Because I want to get into this other part where Jesus used an everyday, uses an everyday example to teach spiritual truths. So he asked his disciples, have you understood all these things? And they say, yes, they so didn't, but that's okay. You know, they thought they did, and, uh, and that's fine because we're probably the same. If Jesus said, do you understand this? We'd say, yes, we do. And then he'd ask us some question, we'd be like, oh. But I, liked, I found this, this next one intriguing, and this isn't so much a parable as it is a comparison. He says to them, therefore, every teacher of the law who has been struck in the kingdom of heaven it's like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. When he finished these parables, he moved on from there. Now this is an example for me, anyway, of a verse that's just easy to read right over and not think that much about. But look at what Jesus says about this shopkeeper. In the story, he kind of compares this, this type of person to a shopkeeper. He says that this person is a teacher of the law. So Jesus is saying every teacher of the law, meaning in his time, every Pharisee, every scribe, all the temple priests, who have been instructed in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, who have been instructed in the kingdom of heaven by Jesus is like this person who has treasures that are both old and new. And I found that intriguing as I kind of dug into it because he, he's lifting up the idea of the teachers of the law a little bit here. He's saying they have treasures. The Pharisees have treasures. There's another place that Jesus says to his, the people around him, listen to the teachings of the Pharisees, but just don't do what they do. You know, what they teach is right. What they do is wring And so he he's lifts up the idea of the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees and the temple priests as the teachers of the law. They had treasures. But those who have those old treasures, who have been instructed in the kingdom of heaven, in other words, have the new from Jesus, these are people with tremendous treasures to give. When I think of this, I think about movies and, and books where, you know, a person, and, and this is kind of a motif you see in a lot of stories. They go into this old, dusty, like, bookstore or curio shop, and the, and the shopkeeper is there, and usually he or she is kind of old and a little bit eccentric, uh, and, uh, and, the sh and the person is telling the shopkeeper they're looking for something, you know, and the shopkeeper gives them this, this trinket or whatever, and says, oh, this is really valuable, and it always looks like something that's not worth much, right? You've seen stories like these, right? Or you heard stories like these? And, uh, and then, of course, they find out through the course of their, their adventure that this, this thing that looked like it wasn't worth anything is really very valuable, and it changes their life. It's a motif that you see all throughout literature and movies and television shows, and it all comes from this parable that Jesus tells. This is one of the ways that the kingdom of God is pervasive throughout our society, even though people don't even recognize it. And I find it interesting that Jesus refers to these folks as teachers of the law, because as I said, in those days, he's talking about the Pharisees, the scribes, the temple priests. But he says that those who have also been instructed by him in the kingdom of heaven, they have tremendous riches. 
And I want to get to the point because I think the way this affects us or speaks to us is this. You have been given the opportunity to have treasures which are both old and new. And the treasure that we have in this, you know, none of us are going to be, none of us are Pharisees or scribes in that sense. But what they had is they had what we call the Old Testament. And they knew that Old Testament and they knew it well. And the believer, I think the way this can translate into our lives, is that the believer that really understands the full story of God, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, they have riches to give. Because just reading the Old Testament but excluding the New Testament is like reading a story without the last few chapters of the book. And you don't know how the story ends. And so you have a, you have a sense of where the story's going, but you don't know how it ends. And on the other hand, if all you really know is the New Testament, but you don't know the Old Testament, then that's like just reading the last few chapters of the book. And you go, wow, that was a really good ending. But you have no concept as to how it got there. And I think this is where the church very often struggles, and probably where some of you have struggled in the past, where you've, you've embraced Christ by faith. The Holy Spirit draws you there. And none of us, when we came to know Christ, I doubt in this room, were well-seasoned biblical theologians. I mean, I went into Jesus with the faith. I didn't really know much of anything at all. And I found over the years that when, when people would ask me questions, especially in my early faith, well, why is it that some guy who dies on a cross 2,000 years ago saves me? The context of that makes no sense unless you have the Old Testament, which talks about sacrifice, which talks about the Lamb of God, which talks about Passover, which talks about all these things that lead to the ultimate revelation of God's character and values and who he is, is in Christ. And then the cross makes sense because it is the sacrifice that has been planted within the story of Israel that leads to the forgiveness of sin and the salvation for all who believe. There is a context in the whole story. And I would encourage you to understand the whole story because we don't have to have a super sophisticated theology to be able to explain Christ. What we have to understand, though, is a story. A story of redemption and salvation. And God chooses the nation of Israel. He chooses this small tribe, this obscure tribe, in this guy Abraham that really isn't even a tribe until he barely has, like, a kid. You know, the big story. He chooses Abraham to have all these kids, I mean, to, to found this nation. He doesn't even have any children. And then that big story for Abraham, the big step of faith is, remember, he goes outside he looks up at the stars and God tells him, your ancestors, will, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the heaven. And it says, by faith, Abraham believed him. And then the apostle Paul takes that whole idea and talks about the fact that Abraham was justified by faith. And that faith is the same in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. It is a belief in the promise of God. And as Abraham was counted righteous because of his belief in the promise of God, we too are counted as righteous because of our belief in the promise of God that Jesus Christ is worthy and able to carry our sins, died for our sins, and rose from the dead on the third day. And unless you have both the Old Testament and the New Testament, you could be reading Romans and wonder, who is Abraham? What does this mean? And also by reading the Old Testament and the New Testament, you can see that in the Old Testament, people have a tendency to want to earn everything that they've got. They want to be able to stand before God and say, you owe me. But by reading both the Old and the New, we realize there's no way, as much as we think we want to, we can earn our salvation to make the God of the universe go, well, I guess I, guess I owe you. Because that's never going to happen. He's the God of the universe. There's no way we as individual human beings can go to the God of the universe and say, you owe me. It's like an ant. It's less than an ant, because I didn't even create the ant. Saying, you owe me. And one of my goals as a pastor is to help us see the treasure that we have in the Bible, both old and new. And I certainly have my weaknesses as a believer. I'm not super, super emotional. You've probably noticed that. And sometimes I wish I could be. Sometimes I wish I could just like release into the emotion that people feel. I just can't. This is as high as I can raise my hands in worship. There's like, there's like I think it's some kind of weird little me mechanism that going above my shoulders is very, very hard for me. I'm not one of these people that are just like, oh, you know, I wish I could be. I, I'm, not I'm not making fun of it at all. I wish I could be. 
And the times, the few times I have I raise my hands over my head, I begin to sweat because it's like so out of my comfort zone, you know? But I know the Bible. And, uh, and, I, and not, not that I'm like a biblical scholar, but, you know, this is what I've been doing for 30 years. And I can tell you, there are treasures in there. And the more that you can make the connections between the story of faith that goes from the foundation of, of the world, from Genesis, all the way up to what's going to be in Revelation, where in the end we're kind of back at the beginning in the presence of God Instead of within a garden, we're within a city, but there's no need for the sun because the very presence of God lights our way. I mean, it's an incredible story when you go through the whole thing. And if I can convey that to you and help you understand it, then that's what I want to do. And so that's, that's one of the places, that's one of the passions I have for you as your pastor is to help you understand the story, the whole thing. And I know it's hard sometimes. I know that we've been doing the life of Nebuchadnezzar in, in the Thursday Bible study because in his life, you see surrounding it and intersects the life of Daniel, the life of Jeremiah, and the life of Ezekiel. And, and people don't even really realize that, that these three are really contemporaries. And they're all looking at the same event from different angles. And it makes the whole thing make more sense if you, just fo- if you learn how the story goes. One of the things I'd recommend as a tool, if you never had one, is uh, a chronological Bible. There's these Bibles that you can buy. And they're especially valuable in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. They put things in chronological order. And that's very helpful if you've, if you've always been confused as to where these prophets fit in. You can buy these chronological Bibles. And they'll take the narrative from the history parts, like Kings and Chronicles, and they'll insert where these prophets are. And also they do it in the New Testament, too. And the place it becomes valuable in the New Testament is in the book of Acts. They'll insert when Paul wrote the letters. So you see, okay, he wrote the letter of Romans at this point. He wrote the letter to the Galatians at this point. They insert, and so it's chronological. And they're very valuable. I found it very valuable when I read a chronological Bible. So I would encourage you to get one of those if you've never heard of them or if you don't have one. And then Jesus answers. They, you know, he talks about this. We've gone there. Then he asks them this thing. Do you understand these things? I find this to be, again, a simple but profound question. Do you? Do you understand? Do you understand what what we have in the treasure of the Bible? Do you understand the treasure that we have in in the formation of our faith, that it didn't just happen in a vacuum, that we're sitting here today because of things that happened 3,000, 4,000 years ago, and there's a direct connection all the way from those times till today? You need to understand it. Because sometimes cults are formed around this lack of understanding. Did you know that Mormonism, you know Mormonism? You heard of Mormonism? The way it got, one of the ways it got started, or one of the arguments that even Mormon missionaries will use is that they'll say that the, 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 the line of the church was broken and it had to be reestablished by Joseph Smith. And that Joseph Smith is the true prophet that reestablished this broken line and therefore the church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints is the true church. And I've actually spoken with Mormons who've said this because my, uh, my family on my wife's side is heavily Mormon. I've often said to them, you know, that's not really true. I can tell you the line of history that goes from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament to the early church to, you know, the church in the, in the Middle Ages to the church today, and I can tell you where it all goes. Do you want to hear that? Because this whole idea that it was broken and had to be reestablished by Joseph Smith is just wrong. And of course, what do you think the answer to that is? Do you want to hear it? Do you want to understand these things? Nope. <laughs> it's not said in that, that direct way, but it's like, well, maybe after dinner. You know, and that never happens. The truth is, we have a faith that can be followed intellectually as well as spiritually. It's a faith that is grounded in history. Now, it's not just kind of made up in mythology. It's grounded in history. One of the benefits of biblical archaeology is that we find pieces to tell us, this is real. This really happened. And, as men, and there are scholars out there that, that embrace that idea. There are scholars that are against it. And this is where, by faith, I choose to believe that what the Bible tells me is true. And I think there's enough intellectual backing up in that for me to be very, very comfortable with that. So do you understand these things? Do you understand the treasure? Do you want to know the treasure more deeply? Because how you answer this question is how you're going to live your life. You can live your life by, by not really knowing the Bible very well and still be saved. Absolutely, you can. 
But you're limiting yourself. You're limiting yourself in the kingdom of God. Do you want to know the treasure? It's there for you. The other thing I would encourage you to do is to examine your life. Because within your life, you have treasures. You have stories that they're just like the stories that Jesus tells. They seem commonplace, but they're profound. And these are the treasures that you need to give to your children and give to your friends. Tell them the stories of your life where God taught you something. Again, like I've told you, every story you've heard from me about my life over the years, none of it has been like crazy spectacular. But it's within those simple things that we can find the profound. And so seek it out. And when you find that treasure, embrace it, claim it, and most importantly, use it within the kingdom of God. And you will be like one of these people, like this story where you go into the shop and you don't expect anything from the shopkeeper. He's just old or she's old and a bit stubborn and kind of eccentric, and yet they give out this tremendous treasure to change his life. You'll be the same way in your workplace, in your home, in your families. You may not have your names up on, in, the, in the lights or on print, but you will be like that person who changes lives because of the treasures that you have given to you by your faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the treasures that you have given us in your word and also the treasures you've given us in the life that you've allowed us to live. You know, all of us have different stories, different backgrounds, one of the amazing things I find in this particular church, because we have so many different backgrounds and, and cultures, that stories, the stories, that things that people have gone through are far different from my experience and far different from each other's experiences. There's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of treasures to be mined in this church body, and I thank you for that. I pray you would help us to take advantage of the gift that you've given us, of our diversity, of our love for you, of our faith, and that together we can use that to really be salt and light in a world which is going through its difficult times. It seems like we go through these cycles of difficulty and we always wonder, is this the end coming close? And then it kind of cycles out and we, we kind of lose some of that fervor. But Lord, uh, the scripture tells us that these times, these difficult times will come like birthing pangs more and more frequently, more and more intense. And uh, Lord, we don't know where we are in the cycle of, of that end, but... We know we're closer today than we were yesterday. And so, Father, help us to be in times like these, that salt and that light. Help us to share the stories of hope that come from our own life experiences. Help us share the stories where we've been disappointed with God, and yet we, still kept, uh, we were still assured by the Holy Spirit that you were there for us in spite of our disappointment, sometimes in spite of our grief. And, Lord, may we be like the heroes of the Bible that don't crumble under those times of adversity, but they turn their eyes to you and they grow stronger. God, we pray that uh, as you're part of this kingdom of heaven, as part of the church, that we will do our best before you and under your grace to walk in your character and in your love, to be like you, so that the church can shine as brightly as possible. Forgive us of our sins. Help us to forgive those who have sinned against us so that your will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.